Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, sorry. Could you start over? Oh, um, yeah, I was thinking. <laughs> Is that a requirement? <laughs> but actually, you know, the history you're right making here is sort of backwards. Uh, the Bible stuff came before the Mormon. In, in a sense, yes. In, in, the brown, in the brown work, right? That's what you're referring to? Most of the references yeah. you're citing. Right. Well, I mean, if you think about it this way, yes. It did come before, but it wasn't put on a large scale, and then all the approaches tended to focus, for the WS, for purpose of WSD, tended to focus on the, on the monolingual approaches. And I think you're referring to the Church of the Well, no, but the Bible, ah. no, oh, the even work was, was, originally it was bilingual. Right, but I mean, on, on a smaller scale, though. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so just to give you an overview of the system. 
So it assumes that you have token aligned parallel corpora at the onset. And then um, what the idea is to group the words that are mapped together to the same word in a foreign language, create what I call source sets, and then assign senses to these source sets uh, from a monolingual uh, repository, and then propagate back these senses, these tags, to the corpora, uh, the respective corpora that you got the, the data from. So eventually, you get the word bank in that, in that specific context with a specific label, bank three or like sense number three from the repository that you looked into, right? And in the process, you get the French word also associated with the same label. So in a sense, it's, it's quite straightforward. You could figure out the rest of my talk from, from just this picture that this is how we're going to build uh, these resources. So just to give you an idea of the performance of our system, uh, this was in the sense of L2 data. And the performance of our system is in the, um, are the blue bars. So it's quite competitive with some of the low-end supervised systems. It's um, above the unsupervised systems. But crucially, it doesn't beat any of the high-end supervised systems. What's the x-axis? I beg your pardon? What's the x-axis? Uh, it's an F measure. Uh, the, the, it's a system. The x-axis is the systems. These are different systems that participated in the, in the sense of L2. Sense of L2 is like um, an... You know what it is, right? Yeah. It's this exercise where they evaluate different WSD systems. So um, the, now how do we use this? How do we functionally use this, uh, this system to get labeled data that could be used in a supervised setting? Uh, the challenge is, as I said, supervised systems do perform much better than, uh, than unsupervised systems, even better, way better than, than my system. And... Um, the, what, what it requires in order to do that, it requires accurately tagged training data. That is a crucial requirement for any of those systems to perform well. But um, these come about extremely expensive and it's very tedious to produce. And what do you do about the other languages of the world? I mean, it's, it's, it's problematic. So um, the goal is to relieve the sense annotation bottleneck for supervised systems. That is how we're going to employ the CELEM system for that. So the idea is to go from a picture like this to a picture like that. And everybody's happy, supposedly. So um, how do we do this in an operational way? So we have this sentence, similar to that first sentence that I showed you with the WSD slide. And you know what words are ambiguous, supposedly. You assign automatically, unsuper in an unsupervised manner, the senses, the, right, the labels to these senses. You figure out somehow which of these are done correctly and which are not and then use that to train a supervised WSD system. So it's pretty straightforward. And today the focus is going to be on this. So um, just to give you like a sub sort of roadmap on this specific section of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the approach and then how do I evaluate and specifically how do I characterize these factors in order to determine which ones are the correct or the, uh, the, the correctly lab labeled data. Um, so the approach is basically take a supervised WSD system, which is trained on manually tagged data, train the same exact system on automatically tagged data, and then compare the performance. And basically, based on that performance, on that what I call performance ratio, uh, I'll talk about this later about the evaluation metric, but um, characterize factors that affect uh, the performance difference between the system when trained on manually tagged data versus the system when trained on, super, uh, on, on, on noisy data, so to speak. So again, just to make this crystal clear, the idea is to identify which ones are exactly labeled correctly. So you have these different data items, and they're all tagged uh, with the Salem system. I can't tell if you can see the, the colors, but all those blue words are supposedly ambiguous words. Figure out which ones are correct. And the idea is to find where the delineation is. Um, so the evaluation data items were the sense of L2 lex English lexical sample task data. And it was um, a set of 29 nouns. And uh, the number of senses range from two senses per word to 19 senses per word, for words like bar. Um, and the evaluation was on WordNet 1.71. Actually, I have a typo in there. So, um, and the system that was used was the University of Maryland supervised system. Um, and it was, it's an SVM uh, classification disambiguation system. And 
his performance in Sense of All 2 and Sense of All 3, in fact, um, came out middle of the pack, toward the high end, but relatively middle of the pack um, uh, for, for the supervised task. So it was a relatively OK average type system. Um, and the automatic annotation system, just to recap, is just our system, the Salem. And um, you can think of it as a family of automatic word sense taggers, having evidence from different languages and different, um, um, like you can imagine it being um, a family, as I said, of, of, um, of different taggers put together to give you combined evidence. Um, as, since I'm not going into any of the details of the system itself today, just bear that in mind. And as I said before, it exploits multilingual evidence for the disambiguation process. And um, crucially, and that's what's going to be very clear in the next part of my talk, that it sense annotates several languages in the same time, for using the same inventory. So the evaluation metric, which I referred to very briefly before, is the performance ratio. And it's basically um, a, like the, the, the F measure on the Salem trained data versus the, uh, that of the manually trained data. <laughs> And um, just to and the test data, as I said before, they're exactly the same. For um, when when the Salem F measure is equal to the manually uh, trained data F measure, the performance ratio is like 100%. It's one. So um, to give you an idea of the training data, how they're very different from each other. So the manually annotated data is very clean, as you'd expect, because it's manual. Um, the Salem annotated data is very noisy because that comes out of my system. Um, there is a very close affinity between the test data in genre, in sense distribution, in perplexity. Like if you look at the different characteristics, and it's, it's done by that way on purpose. Um, so the, there is a very close tie between the test and the training data. Um, when you look at the, at the Salem annotated data, you have less affinity, of course, because the corpora come from all over the place. They're not exactly the same genre. Uh, there are variations in, in, the, in, the, in the corpora. There are variations in, in the evidence, sources of evidence, things of that sort. So it's, um, it's, it's a very different type of, of data. And in terms of am amount of data available, what you get from the manually annotated data is quite limited. It's, it's overall around 3,500 um, uh, training context for all the nouns altogether. In the case of, um, of the Salem annotated data, we're looking at an average per tagger around 12,000 um, uh, annotated uh, context, training context for all the nouns. So um, the evaluation, the results that we got, um, they look horrible on this slide, but I'll fix that. So um, the manually yeah. tra tag training data's performance when it's the same system, UMSST, um, the average performance was 65.3 across all the nouns, across all the 29 noun items. The best Salem um, tagger out of this family of taggers that I used came up to 36. The F measure is 36. Um, the average tagger was 33.6. Comparing that against other unsupervised systems that um, are the performance on other, of other unsupervised systems on the same exact task, on the sample, English lexical sample uh, task, the best was 45. Um, uh, there are actually only five of them. The best of them was uh, a performance of 45, and the worst was 23.9. So it is a pretty hard task for unsupervised systems because it's specifically targeting specific nouns in, in their context. So it becomes, it's a harder problem to deal with if you're doing an unsupervised um, approach to this. But um, if you want to think of, if you have an oracle and you know what, which tagger gives you the best performance, so these numbers here were measured across all the nouns. But if you figure out which tagger gave you the best noun um, performance, so if you do a combination of all those together, the, uh, the, what, what I call the oracle, um, you get a performance boost to 45.1. Now, how do, we, how do we get that, I mean, to work? So, and I just another point uh, before I move on is that uh, just to give you an idea, the state of the art until this paper was published was uh, out of this data set, exactly the same data set, very similar approach to, uh, to dealing with this problem was by uh, Radha Mihilchia. And she got six items out of, to, to have comparable, when I say, comp I mean like very high performance ratio compared to um, a manually annotated, manually tagged, manually trained, um, a supervised system trained on manually tagged data. Um, she got six items. 
Our best salem approach gets you nine of those items with very high performance ratio. The average one gets eight. And then the Oracle gives you 12 of those items, um, uh, very, very close to what you get from the manually annotated data as training data. So um, the, the goal is, so now we have, this is the Oracle plotted. These are the nine, now the x-axis is the noun, noun item, and the performance ratio is plotted on, on the y-bar. Um, and ideally, if we can figure out where to draw this line, so we can relieve the, 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 the annotation uh, for these types of tasks by um, significant, if we know where exactly, which data items we don't need to waste manual effort on and which ones need to be done manually. If we have something like this to figure out which ones are appropriate, we get a 41% reduction in manual annotation, which is significant because they spend years, I mean, it's, it's yes. I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, that's so. I wanted to know exactly what what contributed to this performance ratio, and one of the one of the things that I, I'm going to talk about is this. So, um, so I wanted to identify which factors affected this performance ratio. How can I figure out this automatically? How can I tell? Okay, this is okay, nice and lovely, but how how useful is it? So. The idea was to look at the number of training, co uh, tra training contexts, and I just did simple correlations. And it didn't look like it was very significant uh, in terms of its effect or impact on the performance ratio. Number of senses came out surprisingly uh, unaffected. So we have a word like art that had 17 senses. I had 100% performance in that. And it was kind of like, huh. And a word like, um, uh, I don't remember, uh, off the top of my, some, there was one word with three senses. And my performance was horrible on it. So, is that also related to the fact that probably if you have 17 senses, most of those don't actually occur? Well, I'll talk about this. Yeah. So, um, so and then uh, I looked at sense perplexity. Didn't look like it was very significant either. I looked at some attributes of my training system, of my, of my Salem system, what I refer to. I'm going to explain these a little bit in detail later on. But semantic translation entropy didn't seem to have much of an impact also. Sense context confusability, and this is something that had an impact on the performance. I'll talk about this. Um, and then you can imagine that the, because all this evaluation was done using the test data to, to look at, to, to do the analysis. So you can imagine that being like, if you can uh, think of it as held out data and look at that as a way of gauging your system. So um, I looked at two factors, and these were sense perplexity difference between the distributions in uh, the, the, the training data and the held out data set. And that wasn't a very uh, high correlation. And finally, the one that had a significant correlation with, um, with, uh, with I mean, with the performance ratio, was the sense distributional correlation. Um, so in details. So the sense perplexity is just the measure of entropy of the distribution of the senses for a given noun. So it's a characteristic of the training data. And it's, you would want to have low perplexity. Um, that's desirable. And um, you can imagine, so here, just to give you a feel for what it means, so you have the words bar and day, which are two nouns from our, our collection. Um, Bar has a very, um, has a very uh, high perplexity, because you have something like a straight line. Day has a very, uh, well, you see that spike that tells you it's, it's, um, it's a low perplexity. So that's a desirable, a desirable factor. And day happened to be one of the ones that performed well. Um, semantic translational entropy is just a variant on the sense perplexity, but it's specifically for Salem system because you're looking in the translation domain. So you're looking at a different sort of plane. And, it's, um, and we would want to have a high sense tra uh, semantic translational entropy because that indicates you have variability in translation. And variability is desirable for the performance of Salem. That means that you get the tagging done more correctly. If, if across the board in your parallel corpora, one word, like the word bank, is always translated as bonk in French, you don't get anywhere. You don't have that. That variability doesn't exist, therefore it doesn't help you in your tagging in the first place. So, so that has a sort of like a ripple effect on your, on your performance ratio. So um, sense context confusability. And this is a characteristic of the training data. So it results, everybody in, in our field is always whining about WordNet. 
and here's kind of a, <laughs> a, a, a real reason to whine about it, um, is because of the real fine granularity of WordNet. So f just to give you an example, so the word nation was one of the words that we had in our, in our set. And um, it has two senses, sense number one and sense number three. They're very close if you look at the definitions for them. They're very close. And the way we had this in our training data was the, uh, the set number of Salem tagger contexts it happened to choose to favor sense number three over sense number one in terms of the number of contexts for that. When you look at the test data, you had zero items from sense number three. They, had, they made a conscious decision to just stick with one of these two senses. And my system happened to go in the other direction. And so it's, it's, um, it's very, um, so that had a very significant impact on, on the performance ratio. It's not quantifiable, but it, you, can, you can sense it throughout. And I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, so, and actually in the training context, you don't have sense number three at all. So they, they were very consistent in terms of the, the distributions of, of these, of these uh, senses. The sense perplexity difference is just the be difference between sense perplexity of the training and the held out data set, which is test data. And um, the a lower perplexity difference is desirable. And finally, the one that had the most significant impact is the sense distributional correlation. And this is just a measure of correlation between the sense context distribution uh, of the items in the training data and those in the held out data set. And a high correlation is desirable. So just to give you an example, bar is a very bad example. Um, so you see there is, the correlation is kind of all over the place uh, between the, the held out data set and Salem's performance uh, in, in the best tagger. Um, when you look at a word like spade, the correlations are quite significantly high. And um, that uh, had an effect across the board on all the nouns that we had in our set. So given that we've identified all, these are the ones I, could, I, I thought about and um, thought they would make a difference. So um, just to give you sort of like a synthesis, a synthesized version of this. So now we have all of those nouns. The nouns, and these are um, cut, like the threshold was, I just chose a threshold of, for the sense distributional correlation of anything above 0.75. So stress was the last word. These are not the entire 29 uh, nouns in there. And manually, I just figured if there are sense context confusability or not. But this could actually be automated, but this wasn't part of this, uh, the study at this stage. Um, and the idea was, OK, so most of these happen to have the highest performance ratios, as you can see by the 1.0s and the 0.95s. But then you have 0 0.73, 0 0.59, 0 0.63, 0 0.7, 0 0.44. I mean, these are all horrible. How do you get rid of those? So just looking at these factors, um, you can eliminate four of those just by the sense confusability, sense context confusability. These could be eliminated from your, automatically eliminated from your, from your set. But you're still left with these two, 0 0.77, 0 0.44. We want to get rid of those because they're also a lot, very noisy. You could get rid of church and circuit. Um, the church, you can get rid of it with a high perplexity difference. That was the, the major contributor. And with uh, circuit, you can get rid of that with the low semantic translational entropy. So that way, you can get rid of all those bad, um, bad uh, nouns. If the yeah. test set had been larger, do you think you would just have to keep adding more so, features that would allow you to eliminate the problematic ones? So the thing is, this question com came up also before. Um, the size of the test set, um, or the held out data set, right? That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, we, we, did not, we did not try different sizes to figure out you know, where exactly is the optimal size that would give us an indication. But what, from, from, from just looking at the size of the current test set and relative to the training set from the manually annotated data, it's usually a one third to two thirds um, within that framework. So I'm thinking. Um, if you have sufficient contexts for those, for those words, it should be good enough. And sufficient meaning above a threshold of like 50 contexts or so. Um, so now, OK, so we know that sense distributional correlation combined with sense context confusability are good predictors of performance ratio, but it's not really enough. And uh, semantic translation entropy and perplexity difference happen to play a role in, I mean, cascaded on top of those two. 
So the best predictors will have to be some weighted combination of these different factors. And weighted by what? This is something that is subject to uh, future, or like, in fact, yeah, future research. Um, so the future directions for this is to combine the different factors to automatically figure out what accurate, which taggers per item are the most accurate ones that could be used automatically. And to extend this approach to other languages, I mean, we have Spanish and Italian data. And to uh, put the approach to test maybe in sense of L4, which is coming in three years. So it's, um, it is something doable in this, uh, in this range. So now I'm going to move on to the next part of the talk, which is heavily about Arabic. So um, you guys know what a word net is, right? I, I mean, I don't need to go through this. But um, it's, um, we know that there exist word nets for other languages, not just for English. So there is Euro word net, Balkan net, Indian word net. There is a Hebrew word net coming out. Um, there are word nets for every, most languages under the sun. So um, just to, you guys know what it is, you know what a word net looks like, kind of. And it goes from the most general to the specific. And what synsets are, and the relations hyponymy and hypernomy. And they have meronymy, you have toponymy, you have all kinds of relations that happen between the different nodes. And ideally, our ultimate goal is to have something like this. Or my ultimate goal. That is just me. And <laughs> it looks nice this way, doesn't it? <laughs> it's very artistic. So um, you want to have something like this. But something like this doesn't come easy. Um, so starting from scratch, as everybody knows, is really bad. And we know that inter-annotator agreement tends to be very low.